if all the CO2 that we have emitted into the atmosphere only since 1958 would have stayed in the atmosphere, we would today be at an atmospheric CO2 concentration of 524 ppm. This is roughly equivalent to the year 2050 in business as usual projections of the latest IPCC report. And it is equivalent to a three degree of warming in these scenarios. Luckily, we are not at 524 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere and three degree of warming, but only at 409 ppm CO2 and one degree of warming. The lower curve that you see here is the atmospheric CO2 concentration or the increase thereof, and this is also known as the Keeling curve. So we know the increase in the atmospheric CO2 concentration extremely well, thanks to the pioneering work of Charles Keeling. So he has pioneered and initiated the time series of atmospheric CO2 measurements in 1958. And it is quite remarkable that he managed to keep this time series up and running for such a long time despite large difficulties that he has had to find funding for the sustained carbon observations. We are quite lucky that he's been so successful because this has really become the key figure in climate sciences. As CO2, the increase of atmospheric CO2 is the single cause for climate change. So if only half of the CO2 has stayed in the atmosphere, where has the rest gone? It has gone in roughly equal parts into the ocean and into the land carbon sinks. Together, the land and the ocean have reduced atmospheric CO2 by roughly 110 ppm since 1958 and by 180 ppm since we have started to release CO2 into the atmosphere. The role of the ocean cannot be overstated here. The ocean is the world's largest carbon reservoir. It contains 40 times as much carbon as the atmosphere and 10 times as much carbon as the land. The ocean will be the ultimate storage for anthropogenic CO2 on very long timescales of thousands to ten thousands of years. Currently, the land and the ocean both take up CO2 from the atmosphere. But the land carbon pool also has released a large amount of CO2 due to deforestation and land use change. So the net effect by the land over the full industrial period is really small. So the ocean is the, is the one big carbon sink and provides a huge service to our human society. Yet, this service should not be taken for granted. How will it continue in the future? The more CO2 that is taken up today by the ocean, the less it will be able to take up in the future. And if we think about a distant point in the future, when we try to desperately take out CO2 from the atmosphere, the ocean will release CO2 back into the atmosphere because it wants to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So hopefully this convinces you that we really need to know as good and as exact as possible how much carbon goes into the ocean now and in the future. So how do we know these numbers? As part of the Global Carbon Project, we publish the Global Carbon Budget once a year. So these are annual updates of the CO2 emissions and CO2 fluxes between atmosphere and ocean and atmosphere and land. This is a, a huge effort where roughly 80 scientists bringing in their best data, models and analysis. And I'm very proud to be part of the team. The next release is going to come out in December, so watch out for that. My contribution to the Global Carbon Budget Estimate is that I collect, coordinate and analyze the data that, and that goes into this figure, which shows how much CO2 goes into the ocean each year. This might just look like, you know, a few spaghetti lines uh, for you here, but really there are heated debates going on in the ocean carbon community on how to explain the wiggles and the, the, the trends and the variability of these lines. One example is the leveling off of the um, ocean CO2 uptake in the 1990s. People had already talked about the saturation of the ocean carbon sink. And all explanations so far for this leveling off of the ocean CO2 uptake has, um, has been on climate change effects in the Southern Ocean. So the Southern Ocean is really the key ocean area for anthropogenic CO2 uptake. Um, and that's also uh, what we work on at AVI to better understand the CO2 fluxes, particularly in the Southern Ocean. My more specific contribution um, to, this, to the global carbon budget is that I also contribute one model simulation with the RV Ocean Biogeochemistry model, which is called RECOM, which is just one of the thin lines that you see in the background. And 
we still estimate the ocean carbon sink based on ocean models. We, we don't have something like the, the keeling data as we have for atmospheric CO2. The ocean is, is huge and it's quite a challenge to measure um, the CO2 fluxes directly from, you know, to get directly the observations. So we still use the models, which of course are evaluated against observations. But we also try, and there are also more directly observation-derived estimates um, that we compare to in the global carbon budget. So what are these observation-derived estimates based on? They are based on the Surface Ocean CO2 Atlas, SOCAD, which is a huge community effort in its own. These are all high-quality surface ocean CO2 measurements um, from one specific year here, just picked the year 2017. On this map, wherever you see a color, a ship has been, there, has been there in the year 2017, measuring CO2 in the ocean. Polarstern is also one vessel contributing, but it's really many, many ships, and it's research vessels, and it's also container ships, so they voluntarily contribute to ocean carbon observations while they go past the ocean. Many regions are here covered quite okay, they are quite colorful, such as the North Atlantic close to Europe. But there are also huge data gaps, such as the South Atlantic, the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And you can imagine that it's quite a challenge to estimate how much CO2 goes into the ocean based on, based on such a map. Obviously, we would need more observations to fill these gaps. But scientists today are having the same struggle as what Charles Keeling had years ago, that it's difficult to find funding for infrastructure to, to keep these systems running for you know, standard measurements. Let me give you an example of what has happened with temperature observations in the ocean. A huge infrastructure has been built. These are um, so-called Argo flows or robots that measure temperature um, and the data is available in near real time. As you see on the map at the, at the top corner, the, the map is red all over. So th these robots really go everywhere and there's a super good coverage of temperature data in the ocean. So these only measure temperature and maybe other parts, but they don't measure carbon. So would that be possible? Can we measure carbon from these autonomic floats or robots? Yes, we can, but it has really just started. Similar observations on the marine carbon cycle are being done by these floats. It's quite a challenge. The uncertainty of the measurements is much higher than from the high-quality ship-based measurements, but it's possible. Um, as you might see on the map, there's still, a, there's still a role for Germany and for Europe to step up and contribute more to these infrastructure build-up for ocean carbon observations. So what the ocean carbon cycle community is really longing for is an integrated ocean carbon observing network. This is the challenge ahead of us. So we do need to combine the more classical, traditional, high-quality ship-based measurements where we have to accept that there are data gaps. Um, but we also need to combine that with novel technologies, Argo floats, which have a higher uncertainty but get access to more remote areas and also other novel technologies that I haven't talked about here. So let me give you one example of why we need such an ocean carbon observation network. The IPCC report has been crystal clear that yes, we can reach the 1.5 degree target or uh, threshold, but most 1.5 and 2 degree targets are heavily reliant on carbon dioxide removal. So on the active removal of CO2 from the atmosphere and store it somewhere safely. But they have also been quite clear that there's really substantial uncertainty associated about the, the negative effects of such methods. So what is discussed a lot in the ocean carbon cycle community is what we call enhanced weathering. And upstairs in the exhibition, I think uh, it is called the aging of rocks, which of course is a much better name for that. Um, so what that really is, is that silicate rocks, they do react with CO2 and water, which is weathering. It happens all the time, all over the world, outside. And this, anyway, will be the process which, stores, which brings CO2 into the ocean on the timescale of millennia. So the, the products of this weathering reaction, when they are transported into the ocean, um, they lead to the fact that the ocean can take up and store more CO2. So, if this is going to happen anyway on the long time scale, scientists ask whether this process can be accelerated to, to mitigate climate change and to bring the CO2 into the ocean faster. So we used our ocean carbon cycle model to estimate the potential of this method. 
And yes, it helps to reduce atmospheric CO2, but on its own, it's not going to save the world. If you want to apply it at such large scale that you do see a significant reduction in atmospheric CO2 concentration, you would need a large-scale mining activity for silicate rocks, basically of the same scale as coal mining is, occurring, is happening today. And what about risks and side effects for the ocean ecosystems, but also maybe for the areas where the mining would take place? Nobody knows. And thinking ahead, in case we ever find a safe and well-tested method to take our CO2 from the atmosphere and store it somewhere safely, and if our society decides that this is what we want to do, then the ocean will certainly react to that. If it's whether it's um, an ocean-based carbon dioxide removal method or any other method, the ocean will react to it. And how will we be able to quantify how much carbon goes into the ocean and stays in the ocean? Well, we do need an integrated ocean carbon observing network, being it for accounting purposes, for stock taking, or just for the advancement of science. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>